Hey, welcome back for more Bio 276. This is week 7. We're going to talk plant hormones and plant responses. Here's what we're talking about today and our objectives. Last time we looked at plant nutrition and the need to have the proper type of, of soil and then looking at the cations that are in there and then using cation exchange and, and the role of mycorrhizae and absorbing stuff. We also looked at the rhizosphere and the bacteria that happen to live around the roots and the importance of that and the types of uh, nutrients that are necessary and the fact that you can get some nutrients like nitrogen using bacteria and then we also dealt with some parasitic plants and carnivorous plants. Cell signaling turns out to be a process that like everyone kind of just ignored from <laughs> when you took 174. But it's kind of a big deal, especially in this class when we're going to talk about how hormones work. So it turns out that when we have cell signaling, there's three basic steps. Step one is the signal has to bind to its receptor. That's going to trigger some type of transduction or an amplification or a cascade. And then you're going to get a response. And depending if you have a protein type or a steroid type signal, you get different methods of the reception, transduction, and response. Both of them run the risk of utilizing things that we call secondary messengers as part of the signal transduction or that second step. The three most famous of these are cyclic AMP, calcium ions, and inositol triphosphate, IP3. And all of these, all three of these are involved with triggering cellular responses. Usually we also associate these as being triggered by things that we call G-protein-coupled receptors. Here's an example of a G-protein-coupled receptor. It's um, when the signal binds to its membrane, or the signal binds to its membrane receptor, it releases this thing that we call a G-protein, which re reacts to GTP hydrolysis. And that ends up activating another enzyme, typically some type of kinase, and then we trigger a kinase cascade where we just phosphorylate a whole bunch of stuff. One of the most famous examples of this is ethylene, which is a gaseous phytohormone, and it happens to have an intramembrane receptor found on the ER. And ultimately, one of the things that ethylene can turn on are ethylene response factors, or ERFs. ERFs are involved in gene expression inside of plants. And we know that it's kind of important because we can actually purposefully damage this process or we can start throwing things off. That can include things like ideolation, which is when you grow things in the dark. And then if I were to grow them with ethylene and sensitive plants, I get this weird growing pattern where they act as though, you know, they're not in the dark. They don't have this ideolation pattern where they grow really tall. In class, I walked through, here's how you would interpret this diagram. This is actually how ethylene signaling works. It happens to have its receptor found on the ER. The reason for that is ethylene's a gas, and gases are nonpolar, so they can act like they're a steroid. The long story would be, if there's no ethylene, we actually destroy a protein called IN2, and the result of this is we lose some proteins found in the nucleus. But if there is ethylene, what we're going to do is chop up IN2. IN2 is going to set off a bunch of signals within the nucleus, and ultimately we're going to trigger things that we call ERFs and get ethylene response genes turned on. This is an example of what we call the ethylene triple response, whereas we increase the amount of concentration, what we get is a reduced growth we get a thickening of the plant, and then we get this exaggerated apical hook. We could also have other mutants along that cascade. So we have like this ethylene insensitive mutant, what we call an ion mutant, and then we have CTR, which is that receptor. And based upon what types of mutants you see, you can explain what's going on in terms of the signaling. Phytohormones are basically the plant version of a hormone. And the term hormone is a signal that can end up having long-term systemic effects, meaning it's going to cause lots of changes. It's not just going to be one thing that will change. Many things will change over time as a result of this. 
Most viral hormones turn out to be classes, meaning they're groups. They're not just one type of hormone. This will be in contrast when we talk about human hormones. When we say insulin, what we mean is insulin. It's not a group, it's just insulin. Here turns out to be from table 39.1. Here's the list. Of all of these, ethylene and abscisic acid are the only ones that are specifically just by themselves. Everything else is a group. Auxins are one of the most famous of the phytohormones. Uh, Darwin and one of his sons did some experiments dealing with it, which is this one right here. Where what they would do is they take the root or the apical stem, so they take the top of a plant, if they chop it off, what they notice is they wouldn't get any type of light response. If they cover it up, they don't get a response to the light. But if they have a see-through cap, they do get a response. It doesn't seem to matter if they put the cap somewhere else. Later on, this experiment was repeated, but they glued the cap tip, or the, the shoot tip, onto one of two types of little pads, one that allowed for permeability and the other one that did not. And based upon this, it's a, oh, clearly there's something that can move that's, well, there's some type of signal that's being received by the tip of this plant, and it seems to need to move because this permeable option gives us the response, but this impermeable option does not. It turns out later on we realized, oh, this is dealing with this thing that we call an auxin. Auxins are involved with growth, so phototropism, cell elongation, cell differentiation. It turns out that its movement is actually complicated, and it involves um, things that we call pin, uh, which are transporters, and they actually move auxins around. One of the things that they're also involved in is something called apical dominance. So as we've seen in lab, you could have your plant when it's growing, and you're going to have this thing that we call the apical bud, which will be the very top. You also have these terminal buds or lateral buds. Not terminal buds, but lateral buds or axillary buds. And if you take out the apical bud, this apical meristem, what you see is we're going to get these lateral buds are going to start going off. And the result is the control was removed. And auxin turns out to be one of those controls. Cytokinins are also a group of hormones. They're mainly made by the roots, and they control root and shoot division, lateral growth. They stop this phenomenon that we call senescence, and they're also involved in plant defense. Gibberellins or gibberellic acids are usually made in apical buds and in the roots. They promote germination, fertilization, and maturation, meaning let's make something be more mature, such as making grapes quicker and doing a better job at it. It's also involved with the imbibing of water. So what you do is when you have a seed, we'll talk about this on Thursday, is when water comes into the seed, we call that imbibing, it absorbs it. And what that ends up doing is it produces or triggers the production of gibberellic acid, and that ends up causing starch hydrolysis. With starch hydrolysis, we release energy, and that allows for germination. Which is actually this picture here. Go figure. So everything I just said is found right here. This here actually turns out to be for a monocot. For those of you who remember what a monocotyledon is for a type of plant. Or a, yeah. Psyzic acid turns out to be a misnomer. It's abbreviated ABA, and it's involved with drought tolerance. So it slows growth, and it'll make stom stomata close because we don't want to have water loss, and it promotes seed dormancy so that they're not wasting water. They're usually if they're associated with leaf abscission. But they're not the cause. So leaf abscission is when the leaf falls off. And what they will do is they actually form like a protective barrier where the leaf abscission is occurring, so where the leaf is eventually falling off. And the reason why they form this barrier is to prevent water loss in the plant. This, of course, is in contrast with the cause of leaf abscission, which is ethylene. It's the death hormone in plants. So it's involved with leaf senescence. So leaf senescence is, depending on what 
what's triggering it. It could be age or it could be pathogenic or stress. But leaf obsenescence is the purposeful, controlled killing off of leaves in order to recycle nutrients. Um, that could be done due to age, which means reproduction is going on. It could be due to stress, which means, uh-oh, we just need to, you know, hunker down and let's just reallocate nutrients to the parts that need nutrients because clearly the plant is under some stress. It does the same thing if you have a pathogen. I mentioned the leaf abscission. It's also involved with fruit ripening. So fruit ripening requires you to break down cells, and that's how the plant, you know, the fruit goes from being rigid to being soft because it's being broken down. Brassnosteroids, jasmates, and strigolactones are new-ish types of phytohormones. Brassnosteroids are ones that say, hey, let's make roots, shoots, and xylem. Jasminates are involved with ripening, and I know of them primarily through their work in pathogen responses. Strigolactones are the newest uh, kids on the block, and they deal with germination, apical dominance, and the recruitment of mycorrhizae. One of the things that plants do is they need to respond to their environment. Animals do the exact same thing. All living things do. But with plants, we refer to these as tropisms, and they are usually specific to abiotic factors. We're only going to look at four of them, which will be phototropism, gravitropism, thigmatropism, and stress, so environmental stressors. Phototropism is responding to light, so either grow towards or grow from. One of the things that you can have as a result of light is germination. And one of the fun things that shows up with germination is the quality of the light turns out to matter whether we call this red or far red light, we get these germination patterns. So if I keep seeds in the dark, they don't germinate. If I blast them with red light and then keep them in the dark, it turns out they germinate. If I blast them with red light, then far red light, meaning more in the infrared, they don't germinate. If I go red, far red, red, they germinate. Red, far red, red, far red, they don't germinate. So it seems like the last type of light that they see before this break is the important one. This can be explained through some proteins called phytochromes. So phytochromes are usually just written as a capital P. There turn out to be some versions of phytochromes that are light sensitive. In particular, the ones that are absorptive of red light are called PRs. And those that can absorb far red light are called PFRs. It turns out that PRs are sensitive to red light. So if you take you know, the red form of a phytochrome and you blast it with red light, it gets converted to the far red version. If I take the far red version of a phytochrome and I blast it with red light, it converts back. Or what you can do is have a slow conversion back in the dark. So you don't need to actually force the switch, you can just let it occur. So, it's just kind of confirming, hey, maybe this is the mechanism that we saw with the seed germination. And also, what you can realize is, this is now generating a clock. Because phototropisms are associated with circadian rhythms, meaning the, the general pattern from day to day. Animals have this, plants turn out to have it too. This has become so important that we've actually been able to see it in things that we call long-day and short-day plants. So in reality, long-day, short-day plants, those are misnomers. So short-day plants require less than 12 hours of light, and long-day plants require more than 12 hours of light. In reality, it's act a short-day plant is actually a long-night plant, and long-day are actually short-night plants. They are regulated by phytochromes, with this conversion between you know the red and the far red versions. But when we look at the amount of light that you need to have, <coughs> so if I have you know more light than you need for this critical period, then um, long day or short night plants will grow. If I have this specific length of time, then short day or long night plants will grow and blossom. If I blast with a very long period of time and I disrupt it using red light 
it triggers the short day plants to flower and the short or the long day plants to flower, the short day plants don't. But I can undo it using that far red light and go back to having the short day plants flower, long day plants don't. And I can again repeat this pattern of red, far red, red, far red, red, far red. So we see these patterns of this circadian pattern or circadian rhythm being regulated by this phytochrome. That's ignoring all stuff with auxins and stuff like that, which is another form of a phototropism. There's also gravitropism, which is when we use gravity to dictate how things should grow. So when we think of gravitropism, the root is what we call positive gravitropism because it grows towards where there's gravity. And the stem, or the shoot, has negative gravitropism. It grows away from where there's light, or where there's gravity. One of the things that we think, although there's plenty of exceptions to this, are it's driven by this process called statoliths. So you can see them in here. These are actually just little granules of starch that can build up on one side or another. They'll build up on the gravity side. And depending if you're talking about a root or a stem, this will trigger a different type of response. So if I have them bundling down on this bottom side here, and this is a root, then it's going to grow in the direction that they're bundled. But if this is, so this is for a root, but if this were for a stem, it would actually trigger the opposite growth. So it kind of depends. When I think of the growth, what I mean is this. So if I have statoliths here, what I want to do is actually have elongation on the opposite side. And the reason for that is if this side gets longer, stretches out, it's actually going to pull the entire thing down because the opposite side is going to grow and the only thing it can do is just bend down. We think, again, because there are mutants that where there aren't statoliths and they still exhibit this, so clearly there's something else going on that might be organelles or there's something else happening. Thigmatropism is how plants respond to touch. There are examples of positive thigmatropism and this is vining behavior. Vining is actually a function of ethylene. So that's what this is here. So if you happen to have pea plants and how they grab on to whatever is near them, that's a positive thigmatropism. Negative th thigmatropisms are when the plant like does not like and it responds negatively towards that touch. Um, the most famous of this is the shy plant, Mimosa pedica. So these are the ones I've shown you in class where you touch them and they start to wilt on you. What we know is they actually release action potentials, and that seems to serve as an herbivory warning. So it's a way of saying, uh-oh, something's trying to eat, eat me, there's a big plant touching me, excuse me, a big animal touching me. And typically, animals don't like to eat things that look wilted. So if the plant wilts, the result is it's not going to get eaten. So, genius. In terms of stresses, um, plants do respond to stress in different ways. Uh, they usually will trigger some type of senescent behavior, so that control death. And this is usually to protect the plant overall. Some of these big stressors include the amount of water that you happen to have, the amount of salt, the temperature. One of the things that the plant will do is they will release things called ROS, which are reactive oxygen species which will help control the breakdown of the plant or kill off a pathogen HSP, these are heat shock proteins which can travel into the, and out of the nucleus and they're there to make sure that the nucleus and the DNA doesn't fall apart One of the things that plants also respond to are pathogens. And it turns out fungi, plants, animals, bacteria, and viruses, like everything goes after plants. So plants need to have their own version of an immune system, and they do. So the first thing that we need to have is the pathogen needs to bind to a receptor, 
This is what we call PAMPs. So this is pattern associated molecular proteins. So basically these are like you can kind of sort of think them of, of them like antibodies, how they're different receptors and they can say, hey, wait a second, I recognize this one particular thing. And if there's a recognition, haha, we're going to get a response. So when there is a recognition that's found, we are going to trigger the hypersensitive response using these things that we call R proteins. And among the things is we're going to make a lesion. So we're going to kill off all the tissue near where this pathogen is. We're also going to start to reallocate some metabolites, including some methyl salicylates around the plant, which is a nice way of saying, hey, beef up your defenses, bad things are coming. And then what we're going to trigger is something called SAR, or systemic acquired resistance. This is always the end of the hypersensitive response, and it's going to trigger plant-wide responses like cell death, production of ROS, PR proteins, antivirals, antimicrobials. We're going to start to just kill off whatever we think we just identified. Lots of plants do this, so it's not just, you know, the things I mentioned. Uh, we can poison you, so like opium. We can have little barbs. Um, we can start changing around how leaves look, so it makes it harder for organisms to eat it. We can have crystals inside of the cells that make it more difficult. We can hide where tissues are. Uh, we can have toxic saps. We can recruit other organisms to come and fight our fights for us. We can also form mutualistic relationships with things that are going to protect us. So, plants have options. And next time we're going to talk about plant reproduction.